Good evening. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to Conversations in the Digital Age. With us tonight is Juliana Mayo. Juliana Mayo has written a fabulous new novel entitled City of the Sun. It's about Cairo, a thrilling city, and it is set in the early 1940s, the period when Cairo was a hotbed of Nazi spies and American spies, all trying to deter Rommel, who was the desert fox, from advancing eastward toward his prize holy grail, the Suez Canal. Juliana Maya, we're delighted to have you with us. I am delighted to be here. Now, uh, first, congratulations on your book. Uh, tell me, how long did it um, take you to write it, and uh, how did you get interested in the subject? It took me 13 years, on and off, of course. I did not do this full time, but it really took me 13 years to write this book. It was so much research involved, as you can imagine. But um, the more I read, the more I realized I needed to read some more, and the more fascinated I became, the more obsessed I became, and there was no end to it. Now, the book is entitled, I'm always intrigued with titles, it's entitled City of the Sun. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because the ancient name for uh, uh, Cairo was Heliopolis? Actually, Heliopolis is a suburb of Cairo. Yes, and you lived there, didn't you? I was born there. You were born I there. I was born there, and I lived there, and my parents lived there, and my grandparents lived there. Yeah, Heliopolis means city of the sun in, in Greek. Yes. And um, when did you leave uh, Egypt, and why? Well, that's a loaded question here. I left in 1956 during the Suez Canal. My family is Jewish, and we were actually one of the very first families that were expelled. Uh, it was... Um, but you weren't expelled because you were Jews. This was in the era of Nasser. In the area of Nasser. Yes, we were technically, we were technically uh, expelled because of my mother's French citizenship. But also, you know, the Suez Canal war was really between France, England, and Israel. And being Jews, you know, that was, uh, there were thousands, 20,000 people actually that year were expelled. So um, it was a, a very difficult time. My parents never talk much about it. All I know is that one day was literally a knock on the door and saying, here, Ms. Mayo, leave, please. You have one week to leave. And they could not take any of their belongings. Everything was confiscated. They could take maybe $50 in their pocket, but everything, jewelry, everything had to be left. They could, did not have time, or even if they sold anything, they, they were not allowed to take any of the proceedings with them. And, um, and they left. Thank God that my mother had a French passport. And we were refugees then in France, starting a whole new life without knowing anybody. How it's, old were you at this time? I was three years old. Three years old when you were expelled from Egypt. Yeah. So did you ever go back? I went back. How many times? I went back about four times to Egypt. The first time was actually in the, on business. As, as a lawyer, it was, uh, it was really interesting. And uh, I took, I remember the afternoon off, I had something to do in Cairo, and I took the afternoon off to go to Heliopolis, and my parents had given me the address where we grew up. So I go there with my camera, and I take photos, and I see the building, and I enter into the building, and all of a sudden, I am overcome with emotion. I feel, oh my God, this is where I was, and I'm feeling it. And I go home, and I show my parents the pictures, and they go, this is not the building. I had, they had given me the wrong address. I mean, it was the building right next to it. So, so much for the memories, right? So did you go back <laughs> and, and re-photograph the right address? I went back, and this time, I, yes. And I have another story there, but, um, well, yes. What's the other story? Don't leave us hanging. 
Well, the other story was on a more recent trip, and this time I took my husband and my daughter. I really wanted to share with them where my family lived. And um, so we get there, and they take pictures of a building, and uh, there were two old ladies on a balcony, and they stopped talking to us in Arabic, very upset. You understand Arabic? I understand some Arabic, and I play dumb as if I did not hear them. And says so like, "Come on, let's just get in. Let's just get in." And um, so we go into the building, and here they are, these two old ladies coming down the stairs. And I, say, and I start speaking in French with them, and they start speaking in French back. And they says, "Qu'est-ce que vous faites ici?" Well, my. What are you doing here? Like, exactly. What are you doing here? They did not understand why I was taking a picture of this building. So I explained to them that my grandparents lived here, and they said, well, what's the name? What's the name? And I did not want to give them their last name, because their last name is Cohen. And I was somewhat sensitive about anti-Semitism. I mean, let's face it, I mean, there is a lot of that in Egypt, and Cohen is a dead giveaway. So I say, well, Raphael, Raphael who? And I go, Raphael Cohen, Raphael Cohen, oh my God, and they opened their arms and they say, come in, come in, they totally remembered him. The lady happened to have gone to school with my mother. She knew the entire family. So we went to their apartment, chocolate, tea, and we talked, and it was really a, a, a wonderful afternoon where she was just telling me all about my grandfather and my grandmother and my father, I mean, things that I didn't even know about. Well, that must have been very moving as an experience, but you don't write about uh, Egypt in, in that period, which is what, the period of Mubarak, wasn't it, when you were there? When Last, you met them, yes. When you met them, but yes. you, uh, I mean, who was, the president when you uh, met these people, Mubarak. Mubarak. Yeah. Okay, so but you write about the period of the early 1940s. Exactly. And now, what interested you about Egypt in the early 1940s? Let's focus on that. I wanted to understand my Egyptian roots. I was expelled at the age of three. We lived in France, and as far as I was concerned, I was French. I uh, was educated in France, my uh, citizenship was French, uh, my, uh, my first language was actually also French, and I was always interested in those Egyptian roots, so I wanted to understand what were the Jews of Egypt doing there. And I started reading about the, the there social... There were about 80,000 at that time, is that right? 80,000 Jews, yes, were living there. How many today? Eleven. Now, how do you know there are eleven Jews left in Egypt? I mean, do they register or...? Because they all know one another. There is a woman who is in charge of the Jewish community, of whatever is left of it. And at the latest report, she says that there are just eleven Jews left. Okay, so let's go back to the 1940s. Late in 40s, yes. So I wanted to read about and understand the social, cultural, and political climate of the period in which my parents grew up, so that I could understand, you know, what they were doing. And why 1941? 1941, there was a war, as you know, and Cairo, in addition to being this extraordinary city, turned out to be, in those days, a chaotic city with soldiers pouring into the country from all over the Commonwealth, New Zealand, England, India, France, Greece. As countries fell to Hitler, they all came to Cairo to regroup and to try to rebuild their troops. So in addition to the soldiers, they were a strew of spies, refugees. So it was a very interesting period in Cairo. And I thought, well, that could make for a sexy novel in addition to, you know, everything else. I mean, everything else being the Cairo that I discovered, the Cairo of my parents, which is prior to the war, 
What a rich place that was. Now, the storyline of the sexy novel is a beautiful Jewish woman uh, who was a refugee from the Nazis, uh, whose brother is uh, an atomic scientist, uh, find they sell themselves in Cairo on their way to Israel. Palestine. Uh, and, uh, to Palestine then. Uh, they were stuck there. And, of course, she meets a uh, handsome American uh, journalist who, incidentally, uh, is a uh, uh, spy with the OSS. And uh, there's a Nazi spy who is trying to kidnap her brother. And uh, then we'll see what happens. Uh, now, but how did you, uh, how did you evolve this story? Is it, it's not something you experienced, is it? No, this is not. No. The story is completely fictional. Um, I wanted to have a reason to go into this society. I mean, the main reason was I wanted to understand Egyptian Jews. And I needed a device to enter into that community. So what would be better than to have a journalist who goes into this community knowing nothing and asking questions? Because he's trying to find the, um, the, the scientist uh, who's hiding there. Exactly. The, the Blumenthal, you know, that, that German-Jewish family, Maya being the girl that you mentioned, uh, you know, arrives in Egypt with her family and her brother happens to be a brilliant nuclear physicist and America wants him for the Manhattan Project. Everybody wants him. Everybody wants him. The Nazis want him. So it's a race about finding him. And he is just a journalist and he gets recruited by, his, by the American embassy there to say, hey, you know, we really need your help. There were very few Americans at the time. You know, this guy is hiding within the Jewish community. Find him. We need him. And initially he doesn't quite know why. I mean, they don't tell him it's for the Manhattan Project. He finds out later. But that's how I got him to get into the Egyptian community, asking questions. Now, did you do research about the state of the uh, Egyptian Jewish community in 1942? Yes. And what, what did you learn? It was a flourishing community. 80,000 Jews, 60 synagogues, three, three Jewish theaters, one in Yiddish, dozens of newspapers, Jewish schools, Jewish clubs, Jewish youth clubs, Jewish dance clubs, movie stars, athletes, lawyers, filmmakers, doctors, legislators, advisors to the king. Even the chief lady in waiting for the queen was Jewish. Now, the king was, you have a number of historical figures in the book. Is it, mm -hmm. Do you think of it as an historical novel? Absolutely. So uh, uh, one of the figures is King Farouk. King Farouk always fascinated me. He weighed mm -hmm. 300 pounds and had a great collection of pornography. What, you. what did you learn about King Farouk? Well, I was, you know, 1941, King Farouk was 20 years old and he ascended to power at the age of 16. He was just a kid. In those days, he was not obese. He was actually incredibly charming and very, very handsome. And... Um, drove a red Ferrari. He read everything that he drove was red. He was the only one who was allowed to drive red cars. He, um, he was an eccentric guy. He loved to party. I don't know where you found out about this pornography thing, but I guess it evolved over time. Yes, I read some, some stories about how his houseboat was decorated. It, I think it created some scandals. There were a lot of houseboats then on the Nile, yes. weren't there? One of them was the Kit Kat Club. You write about that. Yes. And uh, what was the Kit Kat Club? Tell us about that. The Kit Kat Club was... Uh, it's an X-rated club, I will say, where, you know, ladies dance and soldiers went on to cheer them. And belly dancers. There were belly dancers and just also regular dancers. And as a matter of fact, one of my, of my character, Madame Hekmet, who is based on a real character, she, she worked with a Nazi spy and she was there getting secrets from British officers. 
it was it was quite a time. Uh, well, you have a, a Madame Samina in your book. Madame Samina. But her real name uh, was, uh, in, in real life, was Hekmet Fami. Hekmet Fami. And she was kind of a Matahari kind of figure who yes. spot helped yes. get information for the Nazis. Yes. And then there was a uh, there were a number of Nazi agents that frequented the Kit Kat Club. Uh, uh, one was uh, notorious, uh, Johannes Eppler. Now he's kind of the model for your, uh, uh, for your character, Heinrich Kessler, isn't that right? Right. And right. Uh, now why did you use uh, fictionalized names for uh, the belly dancer and uh, her Nazi control rather than their real names? Because you use the real names of King Farouk and Anwar Sadat and uh, well, because I really, others. Well, because I fictionalize his story. I did fiction. I mean, it was based on him, but I did fictionalize it. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that the real spy, Johannes Epler, was a murderer. And in our book here, Mr. Kessner is definitely a murderer. I mean, someone you want to stay clear of. Pretty crazy guy. So, but I did give him many of the same attributes that that real spy had. Uh, it was it was fantastic to be able to use real characters into this fictional story. I could not have made it more real. Well, one of the uh, characters is uh, the British ambassador, uh, Sir Miles Lampson. Now, mm -hmm. you had access to his diaries, didn't you? Yes. And uh, uh, you had unlimited access. Now, what what did you learn about Miles Laps uh, Lampson? He was a bigger than life character. I mean, he was six foot five, so he was truly bigger than life. Uh, he was said to be the ruler of Egypt. Everything was under his control. Every aspect of a country was under his control. I mean, he even tried to take control of the military at some point. And um, he alienated a lot of people in the country, unfortunately, which started to have very dire consequences on the country. Now, uh, British imperialism. Yes. At its at its utmost, basically. And there was a uh, a great movement against the the, the British, which was uh, involved um, uh, Anwar Sadat, who later became the president of Egypt, and he was at that time, uh, I think, a major in the army. Uh, Lieutenant, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, he collaborated with the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you explain Anwar Sadat? He was someone who collaborated with the Nazis, someone who made war on Israel, uh, an army man, and then he made the peace with Israel. And what explains uh, uh, this complicated personality? You know, he was not complicated. His number one love was Egypt. And he did not like the Germans any more than he liked the British. In fact, he hated the British, and this is why he collaborated with the Germans. Hitler promised them that he will make Egypt an independent country. I mean, what I wrote in the book is actually true. I mean, there are so many of these events that actually took place. Sadat submitted to him um, a declaration of independence, say, please sign it. We want to make sure that you will make our country independent. And Hitler said, of course, of course. So he says, all right, then I am yours. You know, I will give you whatever secrets you want about the military. And that's why he collaborated. He was definitely not a Nazi. On the other hand, the Muslim Brotherhood, which also collaborated with the Nazis, very much sided with them. And uh, they are the ones who spread anti-Semitism in, e in Egypt. Because you have, and, uh, and do so today, now you, you have in your book a uh, character, Hassan al-Banna, mm -hmm. who was the head of the Muslim Brotherhood. Yes. Now, uh, he's a real-life figure, and that, that was his name. Mm -hmm. And there's evidence that he was anti-Semitic even in the 1940s? Oh, absolutely, more than that. I mean, he's the one who... Uh, who, uh, who sent death threats to Jewish businesses. He attacked, sent attacks to Jewish homes and, uh, and businesses. He was distributing Mein Kampf in the street. There is absolutely no question about that. Yeah, there was, he was the man behind it. And he was very much influenced by the Mufti of Jerusalem. Um, 
who was an Arab and who uh, didn't want uh, Jews to um, uh, populate uh, then Palestine. Right, and they were they they both totally sided with with Hitler. Yes. Yeah. So I, you've uh, portrayed a society in the early 1940s in Egypt, which was. Uh, on the one hand, uh, a flourishing society for Jews, where they occupied important roles in society, and then on the other hand, was a hotbed of anti Semitism and intrigue. The, the anti Semitism, first of all, was definitely not yet spread. It was within a few fanatic, and they took. But the king sided, King Farouk sided with Hitler, didn't he? Yes, but again, King Farouk sided, at, sided with Hitler because he hated the British. He hated that British ambassador who called him the boy and who had total disrespect for him. It was not because of any kind of ideology. In fact, Farouk loved the Jews. He was surrounded by Jews. His mistresses were all Jews. He, uh, he promised— How many mistresses did he have? Oh, I don't know, countless. <laughs> Countless, but his favorite one was Jewish. Um, no, I would definitely not say that Farouk was pro German, except during the war when he so much wanted to get the British out of his hair. You know, they, they, they had no business in, in Egypt. Egypt was theoretically an independent country, and yet because of the Suez Canal, which is the lifeline for the British into to its colonies, the British had to control the country, and it controlled it with an iron grip, which totally alienated the Egyptian people. They humiliated them, they disarmed their own, the, the army, they held the king at gunpoint. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, an independent country? So it was not difficult to, to side with the Germans. It was, it was a statement, it was an anti-British statement rather than that. So no, the country was not anti-Semitic at all at the time. Well, there's that well-known story that uh, Ambassador Lampson uh, tried to get Farouk to uh, get rid of all the Italian retainers he had in the palace, right. and Lampson had an Italian mistress, and he said, I'll get rid of my Italians when you get rid of yours. Uh, and uh, that was uh, one of the, the stories that was often told about Farouk, which, uh, and Farouk, you know, was, was quite a character. Uh, remember the story about uh, when he said there will only be five kings left in the world, the way things are going, there will be the king of England. And the king of hearts, the king of spades, the king of diamonds, and the king of clubs. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was King Farouk. So all right, moving along, uh, you have other figures. You have uh, mm -hmm. uh, the American ambassador, Kirk, who recruits uh, the journalists to, be, uh, to work for the OSS. You have Wild Bill Donovan. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, uh, did these people really play a role in Egypt in, in the early 40s? Well, Kirk was there, yeah. What about Donovan? Donovan, I don't know he was there, but, uh, but everything else about Donovan being this incredible American patriotic is, is true, and he is the one who convinced Roosevelt to, um, to start an intelligence agency. Until then, America did not have a formal intelligence agency, and uh, he's the one who formed the first one, which was called the COI, which then became the OSS, and then the CIA. Donovan was a great guy. A lawyer, too. A lawyer, too. Now, uh, Reza Aslan, an Iranian-American, said mm -hmm. of your book, Quote, it's a fascinating insight into the events that helped shape the forces at play in Egypt and the Middle East today. This book couldn't be more timely. Why so? Why uh, uh, do, did the forces you've written about uh, shape the Middle East today? Because when you look at what's happening today and what was happening then, you can really see that direct correlation. The roots were planted then, and now we're just seeing the consequences. So I think that's what he was referring to. Well, the military overthrew King Farouk, and uh, now the military just overthrew Morsi, who was, uh, and uh, the, even as we speak, there's an election, undoubtedly uh, 
Field Marshal Sisi will win the election. Yes. And you'll have military autocratic rule. Um, exactly. So you think there's a parallel between that and what happened in the early 40s? Well, what happened in the early 40s was, was colonialism. It was the British. It was the West. Let's not call it the British because now it's America. It's, you know, all of us in the West. And it was a, a deep distrust of the West that was formed then. And because of that, of that distrust, because of his aversion of the West, you had the Muslim Brotherhood, you had Anwar Sadat, you had all kind of, all kind of secular, secular groups who banded together to get rid of the British. And, uh, and the king, being seen as the puppet of the British, basically just got kicked out by the military, by Anwar Sadat and Nasser. And this is how the military took place then. King was kicked out. Well, I'm sorry, that's all the time we have. Uh, so, uh, Juliana Maya, I want to thank you so much for coming by. This was uh, perfectly marvelous. And uh, thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more on the digital age. I should say conversations in the digital age. For Conversations in the Digital Age, I'm Jim Zirin. Good night and all the best.